Hi, this is Catherine Lucadu, and welcome to the Catherine Lucadu Coaching site. It is our first, my first interview that I am doing with a woman in business and a friend. And we haven't seen each other in, I think, a couple of years. Right. But um, the reason that we're going to do this is not to talk about business as a compartment or life or whatever. We're going to talk about the whole person and what it means to make different decisions, make life decisions that are life changing, uh, whether that means physically, emotionally, spiritually. But the interesting thing is that it always, it all comes back into your business. And I hear a lot of, and I read a lot, and I hear a lot of people saying, well, I do this in business and I do this at home. And I find that that's, it's just incorrect because we are one person, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like, well, you know, I am a businesswoman and I am a mother. You're, you're, you're all of it. So what I found fascinating with you, which is why Christine Cooper is my very first guest here, um, I found you very fascinating because your story and moving out of your comfort zone is extraordinary and the leaps and gains that you've made in one year in a completely different place where you were over a year ago. Yeah. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Okay. So I turned 63 this year in September. And uh, for the last 20 years of my life, or last, yeah, anyway, the last 20 years of my life, I had worked as an, in an executive position in community-based services, right. um, high stress, and very taxing, and I was doing the commute, and living in Caledon, and working in Toronto, and... Yeah. Long commute. Long commute, yeah. very tiring, and it just, uh, but you get caught into that sort of the status quo of this is how it's going to be, especially I think for uh, a career woman in her fifties mm -hmm. and you look at that and you're in this place and you think, I'm just going to coast now right. till I retire. Yeah. You yeah. sort of get that mindset of like, you know, I'm going to just kind of coast and roll with it because the thought of making changes in your fifties or your later fifties is a very frightening Thing to do. Well, I think it's actually frightening from any age. And I think change is something that a lot of people have a huge fear of, Absolutely. especially if you've never had a lot of it, or maybe they have had a lot of it and they don't want it anymore. Right. So I think that the fact that you decided in your sixties to start making big changes, they weren't little, it was big changes that you started making, but you started small. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what led you um what led you to start thinking about it's time for me to make a change i knew in my later mid 50s that i wasn't really happy with what i was doing and i the thought of spending the next 10 years of my life doing that made me tired right, i yeah. i was getting out of bed exhausted and i knew in the back of my mind there was something that i wanted to do and I did something very interesting. I was uh, in my, I was 59 years old and I went out and I bought a journal from the dollar store. And for eight weeks, I wrote down everything in it. It wasn't like a dear diary thing. Yes. It was I wrote, what time I got up, what time I went to sleep, every bite of food I put in my mouth, every nickel I spent, how much time I spent in my car, how much time I spent online, on the phone, watching TV, everything. I mean... By the time, the, the journal was written with everything from pencils to Sharpies. So I, why? Because why I, I think I needed to create a mindfulness about what I was doing with my days. Okay. And I think we, being mindful, you have to really work at it. Mm -hmm. And, and a, a self-awareness about what does a day in my life really look like? Mm -hmm. So for eight weeks, I mean, there were chocolate bar wrappers, there were airplanes, ticket stubs, there were all, concert tickets, everything. Like I wrote everything down, who I spoke to, like how I spent my money, like even the minutest detail was in there. And after eight weeks, I stopped it and I sat down and I reread the whole thing and I decided I just didn't like what I read. 
Really? I didn't like it well, at all. Well, now that's fascinating. And I decided to make, I said, I made the conscious decision in that moment, I wanted a change. And what was it about what you read back over eight weeks that you didn't like? I felt like there was, you know, when we get on in our later years, um, we start thinking about retirement, retirement, retirement. But I had this inner voice that said to me, the best of me was yet to be realized. I love that. That's awesome. And I, but how do I do that? Yeah. And I mean, I, I kind of came from that school of thinking about, I never hit my head of the ceiling of limitations that other people set for me. I would break my own glass ceiling. And I just knew that there had to be something else for me, but I wasn't mm. sure what, what it was. was. Yes. And that yes. is yes. in of itself a very yeah. scary thing. But what I learned in that eight weeks was that I just couldn't go back to that life. Right. I had to make a change. And it was physical. It was emotional. It was social. It was financial. It was a lot of things. It, it Those eight weeks told me so much about myself that it was jaw dropping. So then tell me, all right, so you read your journal, you see eight weeks worth of stuff. A lot of it, you just, you don't want to go back to that. So how do you decide what you want to do to move forward and how are you going to move forward? Well, the first thing, which was probably the thing that caught everybody in our lives. And when I say our lives, I mean, I'm a married woman. I've been married. Dennis and I are about to celebrate our 35th wedding anniversary oh, in a couple of weeks. So I just said to Dennis, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to do this job anymore. I don't want to live in this house. And we had lived in that house for 30 years of yes, our life. Yes. We told nobody. Yeah. And I mean, I called you and said, and I think it was almost a year from the time we yes. called you to when we actually sold it. So yeah. that tells you that there was a plan in yeah. place. Like we said, this is what we were going to do. Yeah. This is point A. And you had your time frame. Yeah. And here's point B. Yeah. And how do we get from here to there? And I made, uh, you have to become very disciplined. Um, and that self-awareness is something you need to practice every single day. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there was something else for me and maybe it wasn't about making more money. Mm -hmm. It had nothing actually to do with money. Right. It had to do with quality of life mm -hmm. and doing work that actually made, made me feel whole sure. and fulfilled and honest. Mm-hmm. And that was the thing is I felt like I was just in a rote mode. I yeah. felt like a little bit on the gerbil wheel, yeah. but I wasn't really sure what it was I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. I started really looking at, you know, we talk about the SWAT thing, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and things yeah. like, uh, and I started thinking about what it was that I did so well that made me the happiest. And I am very much a people person and the human engagement. And people say to me, what do you do for a living? And I say, I work in the business of the human condition. And of course, I worked in mental health, mm -hmm. right? So that is the human Absolutely. condition. Absolutely, human right? condition. And I was sure. seeing people at their very worst and families at their very worst. Yes. And it, yes. it was very wearing on oh, me. Oh, absolutely. And Psychologically, emotionally. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, there, yeah. And, and I... Doing that journal made me realize how much junk food I was eating, how much I was drinking and not really being aware of it, uh, and, and which is all a form of self-medication, which sure. tells me you're not, I'm not happy right. doing what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And I made that decision that I needed to be happy because the clock was sort of ticking on me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in my late 50s. I'm mm -hmm. about to turn 60. And then I wrote that blog post called The Long and Winding Road, which is a reflection of the story that I'm telling you now. Mm -hmm. And it was the post that I had done that I had gotten the most reads. I think I had over 50,000 reads on it. Wow. And people were writing me, asking me about, you know, how, do you, how did you get here? How did you yeah. do well, this? Because so many people can't figure out the one step that'll take them down that path. The first step is the toughest because you don't really know which direction you're going in or where it's actually going to lead you. Yeah. But the reality is, is that you have the choice mm -hmm. to make the step or not make the step. 
And making the choice of not making stuff is a choice. Yes, it is. But it yeah. wasn't my choice. And mm-hmm. so at 59, I decided I was going to embark on something completely career different, a completely different trajectory. We were going to pull up our roots of a home we've lived in for 30 years and move to a town that we had never you, lived in. Right? Didn't know anyone up <laughs> Didn't, there. I knew two yeah. people, right. four people, actually. Yeah. And one of them was our interior designer. Right. <laughs> but um, I think that we looked at it, it was like, it's sort of an adventure. I had a partner who was really instrumental in supporting me emotionally so important absolutely and yeah. it, you don't have to have a marriage partner to have that no support. it's just a support system but you need a yes. support there's no question yes. and so um I mean when we put the for sale sign on the house people were shocked mm. and and their reaction was you didn't even tell us and I said since when did I have to tell you things right I don't have to tell you things I don't run my life by you. I've Mm -hmm. spent my entire working career working around the parameters that other people put there for me. And I decided I was going to make my own parameters Mm -hmm. now. And I mean, you have to make it real and keep it real. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't expecting that I was going to go off and make multi-millions. It wasn't about that at all. Mm -hmm. But I knew that there had to be something different and that I wasn't realizing my potential right yes and at 59 that's an awakening Mm -hmm. like you think these are the years we think about it's time to wind it down and whereas my thing was "Mm, yeah no I need to wind it up there has to be something well and that's what I loved hearing when you were talking about your journal and you were talking about the eight weeks of notes that you were putting in it That is something that I would say probably 80, 90% of the people don't do. No one, and this I actually just talked about this this week here at my office, was no one ever stops. Have you stopped to think about what you want? Have you ever stopped to think about what really makes you happy? Right. Most people don't. It's just this wheel and it just keeps turning, but no one ever stops it and says, hey, hang on a second. Are you going in the direction you want to go? Have you ever even thought about what direction you want to go? Or have you just been, you know, you got into the job and you just did the job to pay the bill right? and that's it. And And then you you retire. You get used to that direct deposit paycheck going in and you've got your benefits and you've got your this and you've got your that. It's never an easy thing to do, but at the same time, uh, it made my heart skip a beat. Oh, yes. And I really liked what I saw. I mean, reading back over those eight weeks of pages, that is looking, that's the ultimate look into the, to the mirror. And that is never an easy Mm. thing to do because I saw a lot of things about myself that I did not like. Right. And I really knew that there had to be. And that's being really honest with yourself. Oh yeah. And it's raw and it's not an easy yeah. thing to, to go through. And, right. and I never shared it with a lot of people. I didn't, they knew I was making changes, but I didn't, I never said, I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, it's kind of like when you tell people you're going to go on a diet, yes. that's the worst thing you could do. Yeah. It's because then you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. It, it just don't do it. Just, yeah. just <laughs> do it yourself. Thing. Like, just like, yeah. you know, like just yeah. do your thing. Yeah. And, uh, My husband was very supportive and my kid was very supportive. I mean, she was off embarking on her own career. Mm -hmm. She had just gotten her master's and had moved out to Alberta. So it was really just Dennis and I. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I came home and I said to him one day, I've decided what I'm going to do. And he's like, okay. And I said, I'm going to become an officiant. And he did, of course, he didn't know what the heck an officiant was. And I said, I'm going to marry people. He just kind of looked at me and was sort of like, okay. But what then I decided was I wasn't taking the, I called it the Elvis drive through Chapel of Efficiency <laughs> yes. School. Yep, yep. I opted to study an enriched course mm-hmm. that was based out of the States that was not cheap to take, but it was deep mm-hmm. and it was rich and I had to study really hard and I had to write papers and I had weekly tests and the course took a year. Wow. And so basically I spent a year drilled down and I studied my face off 
and I came through it with flying colors in the end. I think it made me a much better officiant. And I got my, last December, I got my license from Wonderful. the province of Ontario. So I good. think it showed up on December 30th. I had already booked weddings for this year, even though I wasn't legally licensed yet, but I knew my license would come through. It was a little bit of a gamble. So let's pause there. Okay. And you pass your tests. Yeah. Now what? Then it was, I sat down and I wrote a marketing plan because I'm okay. a one person, it's yes. a one person business, sure. right? Mm -hmm. And so here's the thing I learned. I used to watch my cat out in the backyard chase squirrels and she used to jump and I asked the vet about this. She'd jump at the squirrels and she'd jump, she'd be like this, jumping at the squirrels. She's a tiny little cat jumping like this and I asked the vet about that because it was weird. It looked really weird. Animal kingdom thing, right? <laughs> and the vet told me that the reason the cat does that was so that she could make herself look larger. Interesting. To the squirrel. So she looked like a bigger, more ominous beast. So I was like, how do I make a one person business? Because I'm an officiant. I'm by myself. Mm -hmm. It's a sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. I'm not incorporated yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's something else down the road that will grow out of this business. Okay. Um, and so I realized that branding my, myself yes. and my, my brand. Because you are now the business. I am the business. Yeah. I, and so I needed, and I sat down and said, okay, what do I, what does my brand look like? Mm -hmm. How do I set myself apart? Because there's lots of officiants out there. Mm -hmm. There, how, how do I set myself apart from other right. officiants? So I, I actually sat down and I wrote a full business plan for myself about what it was that I wanted good to for do. You. Yeah. So good. You can't, you know what, if you don't have a plan, yes. that's kind of like tantamount to taking a hike in the dark without a flashlight or any, or, or taking a road trip without a GPS. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's, yes, it's a indeed. stupid thing to do, right? So I had the plan and said, this is what I want to do. And this was where I went with it. And I came up with sort of a, a branding look that I wanted to go to. And I developed my, so, my social media. And then I just started, I hit the pavement. And I started banging on doors and introducing myself to event planners and to really... Uh, top line florists and funeral so, homes because I don't just do weddings. How did it feel doing that? You know, because you are starting right from scratch, scratch. right yeah. from the beginning in a town where you don't know most people. Nobody. I knew no one. But what what is it that made you get up in the morning and say, this is what I'm doing today? I think... Uh, I believed in myself so much that I knew that this was what I really wanted to do, that yeah. this was going to make me really happy. Because I'm going to tell you something, in that 30 minutes or so when I do a ceremony, mm -hmm. I can't even tell you the euphoria that I feel. I love that. That everybody in that room has stopped moving and they're focused on the bride in that, or the couple, mm -hmm. I should say the couple, mm -hmm. and me. And it's like sort of the trifecta moment sure. for us, right? And and I guess after a while, you people aren't even there anymore. No, and it's you, just the three of you. No, and that's yeah. I tell I tell couples that when I start your ceremony, just know that every word that comes out of my mouth isn't for anybody else there. It's solely for you. And if I can get an appointment with a couple or with a potential. Um, partner in the business, someone who will refer to me, all it takes for me is to get that first 15 or 20 minutes with me mm -hmm. and I have them on the hook, right? Mm -hmm. And I can close that deal. So I've learned to well, be a I deal Well, I think closer. they feel your authenticity. I think they feel your enthusiasm. Absolutely. Because I think that that is what shines through when someone really loves what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You feel it. It's not, yeah. it's not fake. It's not a job. Because right. it's not a, and I don't think this is a job for you anymore like you had no. in Toronto. No, this isn't, there's nothing job-like about what right. I'm doing at yeah. all. It's, it yeah. just feels uh, as though somebody has just plugged me right back in and my batteries are on full charge. Uh, I just noticed the difference in the way I hold myself, the mm. way I speak to people. I've had to work harder at listening 
as mm -hmm. well because mm -hmm. people are telling me what they want to have happen mm -hmm. in one of the most important benchmark moments of their life. Mm -hmm. And it can't be about me. And I make it very client-centric. And you have to work at that mm -hmm. um, because it. So I've seen weddings. I've been to weddings where I've seen officiants or celebrants go off script or off mm -hmm. tangent and you're just sitting back there and I always sit in the very back because I'm watching the people in front of me and all of a sudden I notice like the phone starts oh, yes. coming out and they're kind of like this because yeah. the person who's speaking has completely yes, lost it. They've right? lost it, yeah. 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 So there's yeah. a real I mean people ask me what I do and I say I'm a wordsmith. It's at words the word wordsmith is actually on my business card. I am a wordsmith. So tell whoever is listening, um, what is a wordsmith and what do you mean by that? Well, some people would think it's a writer, but I think it's, uh, okay, the, you're, it's like creating art with words. Yes. We're yes. Cre I'm creating a thought, a feeling. I'm, you're telling I'm, a story. It's evocative. Yeah. It's provocative. At the same time, I often ask couples, do you want to laugh? Do you want to cry? Do you want me to make other people laugh and cry? Like, <laughs> yeah. Tell me what you want. You know, I do a 52 question questionnaire with my clients and I give them to couples and separately. Mm -hmm. They're the same questions. I ask them to fill them out to me and not show them to each other because they're the same questions. Nice. And it's so interesting oh, yeah. what comes back oh, yeah. to the same question. Mm -hmm. You know, I do vow renewals and I'm waiting. I can't wait. This is why I know I'm, I'm like destined to do this. Like I can't wait to do a vow renewal for a couple that I married. Whether it's five years or ten years yes, or whatever, yes. like I'm, yeah. it will happen for yeah. me. I know it yeah. will happen yeah. for me. And then it's always not um, happy moments either because I do funerals. I specialize in funerals. So tell me how that is because you were in a very emotional job, yeah. which was very trying and taxing on you. Yeah. So now to go and do funerals. How do you get your mindset around that? Well, you know, a lot of people ask me that question about, don't you find it really difficult? First of all, I'm detached in a way because I don't never, I didn't really know the person okay. in most yeah. cases. Okay. But I had a very interesting experience. I actually did a funeral and a life celebration for a client who was terminal and she hired me. Oh, yeah. She interviewed me. Wow. She was a businesswoman who uh, brought Interact to the workplace. So she had made her, she had really like biz, big business chops. Mm -hmm. And she's a very business-like woman. And she had an episode and he thought she had a stroke. And it turned out she had three tumors and a mass. And they basically said, put your affairs in order. And she decided that she wanted what she wanted for her life celebration mm -hmm. and, and the funeral business part of it. And she knew what she wanted and she decided she was going to hire someone to make sure that it was done. And wow. so by six degrees of separation, we ended up connected and she literally interviewed me. Wow. And it was really interesting. I got shivers. And this, I don't know. I and don't that think was, I could do that. That was in October of last, of yeah, October uh, she had her diagnosis, and she passed in February of this year. And um, I had spent some time with her, and she basically almost dictated her life story to me. And I just sat, and I was just writing, 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 wow. writing. And she had notes scribbled on napkins, and she had old photographs, and she talked about... She picked everything from the flowers to the catering menu wow. to the what she wanted on the bar, the music played, everything. And she made me promise that what she wanted was what she would get. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that was a big responsibility for me. And so you asked about doing funerals and, and I talked about specializing in suicide. And I think that really stemmed out of what I learned in dealing mm. with families who I saw really stranded. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you celebrate the life yeah. of someone who has opted to 
take their life. Yes, yes. And so um, it was very difficult. And I, I would go to so many funerals in my capacity as a director and often be asked to speak. And I would just see people really struggling through it. And I, especially if, if there was, you know, a lot of uh, religious-based uh, organizations won't touch a funeral if there is suicide right, involved. Right, yes. And so families were yep. really stranded. Right. And so I felt that was like a very niche market for me. And so I offered that. That is one area. And I have made that very clear to the funeral directors that I work with. Mm -hmm. Like this is an area that I can manage, help you guys manage and help families manage mm -hmm. through it as well. But also, you know, a celebration of life. There's some wonderful and amazing stories that people can share. I can imagine. And uh, it's really a rich moment. And I have had a few moments. You learn to, first of all, I write everything. Mm -hmm. There's no off-the-cuff mm -hmm. thing happening here. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are moments where you can sort of digress. And I actually have them in my speaking notes. Like, you can ad lib here. Because mm -hmm. it's almost like you have to play to a room. Mm -hmm. You feel what's happening. Well, and I think that, that especially since it's so emotional, you have to be really careful in the words, like of you course. said, the words you choose. Hence the wordsmithing. <laughs> exactly. Right? And you really, uh, yeah. I do a lot of reading. I mean, I, in, in ceremonies, and I've studied the rituals and passages of ceremony, and there's some very interesting, the indigenous ceremonies right. really caught my attention mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what they do, how they celebrate life and birth and death and, and milestones of people's lives. Really, really interesting. So I really honed in on, on that. Mm -hmm. And just, I think, you know, you learn to control your breathing mm -hmm. um, and, I would write script and read it out loud and mm -hmm. speak it out loud yeah. and constantly. And then I would do it in front of my husband and, mm -hmm. and I, I have my own cadence. Mm -hmm. I mean, could not, I don't believe everybody could do what I do. No, I don't think everybody could. Right. No. I know that there's no. definitely some people that are very good at it. And I, my goal is to be the it girl in Georgian Bay to go to last week. I booked 11 weddings for 2020 and one Imagine. for 2021. Imagine. And you've been in business for? Well, I guess I've, well, I've been performing my first wedding. I performed last April. Um, my first funeral I did in February because wow. you don't need a license to do funerals, but you need a license. You need a license from mm -hmm. the province mm -hmm. to marry people. So I have already booked 11 weddings for 2020. And where would you say that the majority of those people found you? That's kind of an interesting question because I always ask people. Yeah. And here's the thing about making friends and, and networking. I became friends with the clerk uh, in the Simcoe area where you go to get your wedding license. Okay. And... I had actually knew her husband and she is uh, legally uh, capable of marrying people. So okay. if, you, if you want to get married at the courthouse at mm -hmm, the mm -hmm, town mm -hmm, hall, mm -hmm. she does it Monday to Friday, nine to five. So people would come in and they want a weekend wedding or a night wedding or whatever. Mm -hmm. She didn't want any part of it. And she'd say, call, here's call Christine. We strategic had, marketing. Yes, very much so. Yes. Because she people were going to her. Mm -hmm. And so we became not I wouldn't say friends, but we became very respectful associates. Mm -hmm. See, this is as you're talking and I'm listening and I'm thinking, that's why. It's not a coincidence no. that a person becomes successful in what they've chosen to do. You have no. put a lot of forethought mm -hmm. into all of it how you want it to look, how you want it to sound, how you wanted people to, to, un, to take you, you know, what, what image, what feeling you wanted people to get when they met you, even before they meet you. Mm -hmm. If they, you know, if you send an email or you send material Tele as well. Uh, well, of course, because I have, you know, web and I have uh, e, e messenger, like through Facebook yes. and I have my own, I have Google page and all that type of thing. Often I would get messages 
through my inbox from messenger Mm -hmm. saying, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was, I'm always very quick to respond. Mm -hmm. Uh, and interesting. I've had a couple of brides tell me that they've messaged to officiants and heard nothing for a couple of weeks. This is very common. And you know what my response to that has been is, and this is what I tell my clients is that a lot of officiants are do it on the side. They yeah. have a full-time yeah. job and they do this on the side. Mm-hmm. And I said, this isn't my side hustle. Mm-hmm. This is my hustle. Mm-hmm. I didn't hang a sign on my house yeah. um, for fun. This is my hustle. Mm-hmm. I knew what I really wanted to have happen with it. Yeah. And it, that was the big thing was because when I went, when we moved to Midland, I was working in a little part-time job in a food shop which was great because, you know, I love food and yeah. that's my other thing. And um, I met a lot of people. And everyone I met and talked, I think I told everybody that I met that I was studying to become an officiant and I handed out business card after business card so after good. business card. So good. And out of that, that has come back sure. to me as well. Yeah. But the moment I decided that, the only way I would be successful at being an officiant was I had to have both feet in it. And this is exactly what I do when I coach and train people. If you're going to do it, go all in. in. Right. Not half, not no. a little. You decide that's what you're going to do, go all in. So for the first six, seven months, I was still working in the shop and I was promoting my efficient services. And then I came home and I said to Dennis, all right, you know what? It's got to be all of one or all of the other. And yes. I like being an efficient way more. This is this was my chosen yeah. path. Yeah. This was my conscious decision. This was going to get me to that place where I knew I was going to be the better version of myself. Yes. And that's where it took me. And the minute I did that and I left the other thing behind... It just took off like a rocket. I, I can't even explain what happened. It was just, it was... It was momentum. It was it building. Totally. With, but it was building without you knowing it was building. You were doing what you were supposed to do, and then it was working in the background. And always, always a plan. Yeah. Always plan. And I also treat it like a business. Yes. I I keep... I mean, I sat down with an accountant and said, how do I keep my books and what can I claim as my expenses? Mm-hmm. Because basically I'm using my home right. as my office. Yeah. And of course, that home is spectacularly sweet. Well, you you created it. You know, you ground People, up. I mean, I have couples who drive up from Toronto who they rent venues because Farm weddings are so popular. Oh, huge. Farm huge. weddings, yes, right? Yes, yes. And they drive all the way up, and they usually come on a Saturday morning. They come, as soon as they come in the door, they're like, whoa. Wow. And, oh, here, let before we sit down, I bring them into the kitchen, and I've just baked scones. Oh, my God. And so I have nice. coffee, and I have tea, and I have orange juice yeah. and ice water. And I'm like, before we sit down, and you, I figured you've driven all this way to come meet me. Yeah. The least I could do is... You have already set the experience yeah. before you've even talked to them. And that is the deal yes. sealer right yes. there. Yes. I mean, if they come through my door, they're leaving with a contract. And that is so beautiful because... This is what's missing when people brand a business. They yeah. think it's just a website, a business card, and this. It's not. No. It's all the other stuff where you come out because that's naturally you. Let me put out some drinks and scones and whatever because right. that's you. Actually, I'm going to add Christine's Kitchen um, blog to my website where because I believe – Writing ceremony is like creating a recipe. Oh, yes. You know, there's oh, yes. harmony oh, and, yes. and, you know, it's yes. like baking and yeah. things like that. And there is very little room for error and things yeah. like that. And you learn to be almost chameleon-like. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I've had couples. I mean, I did a wedding at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning in a pair of jeans and a Metallica t-shirt and <laughs> flip-flops. <laughs> I mean, they, yeah. I include, I, I mean, who knew there were Metallica lyrics that were romantic, but apparently I found them 
took me took me three days and and a half a bottle of wine, <laughs> but I did f eventually find it, and they they were so delighted. A week after the wedding, this big floral bouquet showed up to the house. And Dennis said, somebody sent you flowers. And this lovely couple that just got married with their best friend's present, they, and they brought a tray of Timmy's in and a box of bear claws. And, so nice. And I did their wedding. I mean, not everybody is, you know, 300 people in the yes. big gown. I mean, yeah. so you just go with the flow. Yep. And you learn to adapt really quickly. But my energy is so positive. Mm -hmm. Like when people come to meet me, because I am my brand mm -hmm. and I have to portray that. Absolutely. Right? And you never, yep. I stay in my own lane. There are other officiants in town. I never look at what they're doing. I don't really look at their marketing. I have glanced at their website and things like that. I, I don't, but you don't need to. I don't set my, my fees Same by length. what they charge. Yep. I This is what I charge. This is what I do. This is what I offer you. Mm -hmm. And as I've gone along, I've learned to improve upon things like yes. the scripts, the, the wedding scripts. Mm -hmm. I used to bring them home because I have them in the binder and I would do the wedding and everything. I come home and I have all this paper and I used to drop them in a shredder. Well, now... I created this beautiful branded folder. I take their wedding notes, their whole ceremony oh. script, and it's got my little edits and handwritten notes in the side, and I tuck them in the folder nice. with the legal document that I have to leave them and a little card with my logo on it, thanking them for choosing me as their officiant and allowing me Wonderful. the privilege to do this for them. So nice. And I put their wedding date into my calendar and in a year from now I'll say a year later Follow up. I send them an anniversary so note. nice so this has been wonderful thank you you have literally gone through what it means to run the proper business with being authentic but just doing it in your way and becoming successful at it in such a short period of time it's been amazing. I've I've been I've loved watching it. Thank you. And I've loved <laughs> the, the pictures that you put of the couples and sometimes you have little, little testimonials that they've written. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is so important. Words because, of kindness, I call them. Right. But you now see that you have left a mark on them. Mm -hmm. But it's also good to see that you're you're it's all coming together. It's just like the the circle is just filling in. I hope that you have uh, taken parts of this because all of it, I would say, if you could write down <laughs> notes, um, everything that you said was right bang on uh, in the way that the branding and the business and just, I think, first and foremost, moving out of your comfort zone and yeah. not to be afraid to do that because everything special is on the other side of that comfort and zone. And that wasn't just a, a comfort zone of my career. That was a life comfort zone. Like All of it. I mean, we pulled roots up. And, and just walked from everything that we knew, yeah. and it became an adventure, right? Well, and you went all in. There was no, yeah. well, we'll do this and we'll do that. It was, we're going to do it all, and it's going to work. Totally. And that's what I love. There's no plan B. We're just going to do it, mm -hmm. and it is going to work. And you were confident in yourself enough to believe it was going to work. And it's fun. Yes. And I mean, I, I'm liking who I see when I look in the mirror now. Like, I look, and I see this... I'm 63 now. I kind of started this at 59, making that conscious awareness to me. Now I'm 63, and I still think there's there's another chapter here for right. me. You're so. now alive again. Absolutely, no yes. question. Well, thank you. So if you know of anyone, um, it's not really going to be a pitch, but you know what? Christine Cooper, officiant. If, uh, if Christine, anyone is looking. ChristineCooper.ca. ChristineCooper.ca. Yeah. If you know of someone who's looking for to get married or vowel renewals mm -hmm. or... Baby namings. Oh. I do baby naming and, oddly enough, pet funerals. And pet funerals. Oh. Yeah. So this thank has you been for, great. Thank you for uh, inviting me back because you basically were there 
when we made the quantum leap decision yeah. to... And I remember you sending me emails, don't say anything to anyone. Nobody oh, knows I'm doing this. life in a small town, right? <laughs> you just want to do, you want to yeah. do your own thing. But it worked. But it worked. It all it worked. worked. Awesome. It all worked. Good for both for of us. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.